What you're looking at on the screen is a painting called Looking Out, actually Looking Out too. Uh, this is a series of paintings that Bill did during the shutdown and the start of the pandemic in March. And so my first question is to him, whether this, this sheltering in place and the pandemic has changed either his working habits or his subject matter? No, I wouldn't say it changed my subject matter as we, as, as you know, Marge, I have done many, many paintings of people in their homes. In fact, that book that came out at home is where people find uh, their, their, their lives and where their lives revolve around and that private, way in which they live. And uh, that always attracted me. When I pass a house and I see people in the gardens or at the house uh, uh, picking flowers, I am always impressed by I'm peeking in on that privacy. So that when the pandemic started, uh, the people who are at the doorway, I have found have retreated inside. Uh, it was a natural progression for me. Uh, the pandemic uh, just came to change things slightly for what I was doing. So now on this painting, for instance, I have the people inside. Uh, I, and it, it's called looking out. So it really is looking out of the window, but also looking out for each other. And uh, of course, I have... The, uh, I have them up, uh, alongside a night sky, the moon uh, shining on the water. I don't know if you notice that, but the moon is shining on the water. And I like the idea of putting mystery, the darkness, the threat of darkness, the threat of night alongside its beauty. I think the juxtaposition of the two extremes appeals to me. Uh, the figures, uh, Inside, uh, I just want to make one remark about the figures. Actually, someone once asked me why my my uh, portraits are so kind of hazy or, or rough or whatever they would say, and I have found that when I paint uh, figures, if I try or, or I do a precise portrait, it never works with the mood of the painting. I find it is necessary to move the paint around in, on the faces as I do in the rest of the painting. I move them around until I find the right expression. I don't put the right expression down. I find the right expression. And when that happens, it clicks. So that's why the faces may appear odd at times to some people, but they are in fact uh, expressions that I, that I have discovered on the canvas rather than and paused. I, one thing I, I noticed about this painting right from the beginning and um, it is, the, is the slightly askew line of the side of the house. Uh, and I, it, this is just my reaction. I don't know what you intended, but it, it gives it a slightly Mm, not so, it makes it slightly not so safe a place. Yeah. It's not totally stable. I know, I know what you're saying. Yes, uh, that was, uh, I don't like logic. Logic in painting is a destruction. And I try not to be adhering to logic. If I draw that thing at an angle like that, as I did, and it looks right, it stays that way. I don't want to, I don't want to correct it. Well, I, I love this one, and uh, I wish we could stay longer on this one, but we can't. So, so the next thing we're going to do is move on to Bill's new series of work, The Triptychs. And um, in, in order just to set this up before he talks about his triptychs, which are quite different, I just want to uh, have him look at a very classic triptych. This is a 15th century Annunciation, as you, as you can see. Um, and and I, you don't you don't have to say anything about this unless you want to. But this is the classic form. Oh yeah, I understand. 
Yeah. Okay. You you know, moving from left to right, right. pretty much, right. and a very strong narrative. Right. Uh, the angel Gabriel is is telling yeah. Mary yeah. that she's going to yeah. have a baby. A the friar is listening at the door. Okay. Okay. But the next one is just a treat for you. Okay. Okay. Oh, the Bacon one. <laughs> yes. The Francis Bacon scripture. This is uh, three studies for a crucifixion. And the reason I put this one in, and Bill didn't know he was going to be looking at it, no, is uh, for one thing, because I know Francis Bacon is one of his very favorite painters, but also just to remind all of you that the triptych is very much alive and well, the, this clat in the classic form, with uh, Picasso and Beckman, and here you are with Bacon. Well, yeah, I want to just mention one thing, actually. The, uh, the, the new work I'm doing, actually, are not triptychs. They're not triptychs. Triptychs, as you can see here, there are three paintings. Each painting is different. They only are related by subject matter. Right. They are not related uh, visually, not, not visually, not related as a single, as a single painting. They're, they're split into three separate paintings, and the three separate paintings have different subjects, but are related, and that's how right. what a triptych is. So that's all, all I'm pointing out. That what I, what I'm doing not is not a triptych, but that's it's actually a splitic, <laughs> if we can say it. Splitic. I don't know how to say it or spell it. So you, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, splitic. Okay. But could um, we just call them triptychs? Just just call them that, because you have been. We have been. So let's, I, that's, but, but quite right. They're very different. And yeah. so what I'm going to do is so, ask you, yeah. let's, let's take I, a look just, at- Although I love Bacon, yeah. I love Bacon because the paintings, the color schemes are beautiful. The subject matter can be very, very uh, horrific. And uh, I'm not a, a fan of horror paintings, but I am a fan of, Beautifully painted paintings, and Francis Bacon is a beautiful is a beautiful painter. If you turn them upside down, if you turn the paintings upside down, the color schemes and the composition is quite exquisite, and I guess I like him for that reason. Okay, now I'm going to now show you one of Bill's latest series, whatever he wants to call it. I'm calling it a triptych. And, and before we talk about this painting in particular, um, maybe we could talk about this whole series in, in a more general sense. For one thing, uh, all of them are less abstract and, 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 um, and more narrative than some of the paintings you've been doing recently. And could, could you just talk about how, what, why you started doing Yes, that? I will do, actually, yes. Uh, it's quite true. Uh, I was doing more abstracted work until I started to do this particular series. And the reason was, uh, I was, during the winter time, I was uh, fired up to, to paint. You know, little uh, psychic things were happening and I had to bring them out and I wanted to paint. And I wasn't quite sure how to start what I wanted to do, but I was, in a, I was in a state of wanting to create, wanting to express something. Uh, someone came to my studio and said, uh, I remember a painting of yours of 20, 30 years ago that stuck in my mind. And I said, oh, what painting was that? And he explained it. And it was a painting that was split into three like this. And then I, I recall that someone else made that same remark to me. So in my, uh, in my, the mood I was in, I thought I will revisit that and see what, uh, what was so appealing about it. And I looked at it and I realized that this was the beginning of something for me. And it was uh, how I, uh, I started to split the paintings in three. What I actually did, I, I did not do a triptych. I don't call it a triptych because what, all it is was moving the horizon slightly away from, the, away from the, the center panel. And I found that by doing that, it had a certain effect that appealed to me. It gave, as someone said they came, who came to the studio, it, it, it removed the barrier of logic 
and he was able to enter it through his senses more easily uh, than otherwise. The other thing another person said, it gave him a feeling of more of a three dimension of bringing the center panel out so that there was more of a movement in the picture planes, movement in the picture planes and movement in the in horizon. And that movement I found uh, had an emotional impact on the paintings. And some of the paintings, as we'll see later, uh, some of the sea, some of the more uh, rough sea paintings, it plays a major part. But in this one, that was how that's how the triptych started, and how the, the split tick started, <laughs> and that's how uh, how I began, and then came a series of about twenty paintings. Uh, the size of those paintings are quite large, by the way. In case you don't know, they're uh, roughly they were either three feet by four feet or two and a half feet by by four feet. So the the large paintings, although they're they give looking at them here, they're small enough. Yeah. But, um, the, do you have to think differently about your your composition, your color, your your line, because you're splitting the plane? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, I've, I'm always I'm always interested in structure. I find that structure is a basis of all good paintings, and and ever since I saw the paint, structure was a part of what I really was interested in and uh, as well as color, but structure in particular, so that when I started painting the, those split ticks, uh, I was able to uh, use the structure uh, to the advantage of the expression of the painting. Uh, I, I should mention actually one, of, one other thing. Uh, I've been asked why, this is the, the resting fisherman, uh, the resting sailor, and I've been asked why I, why I do so many resting or sleeping figures, which I do. And, you know, and as I've said once before, that every artist is born with a small set of poems. And it's the exploration of that personal mythology that defines them as a painter. And part of my poetry, part of my personal poems uh, are sleeping figures and we, we'll see more and resting figures and we'll see more with the next one. I think it mo it'll be more, uh, uh, something more we can look at and talk about. You wanna do that? Yeah, do you have any questions about this one? No, actually the, you you anticipated my question was, which was about this, this, this theme that runs through a lot of the work, resting, dreaming, sleeping. Yeah. So, so let's go on to the next one. Yeah, this is the, uh, this, the, this, the uh, resting mer mermaid. Now, to talk about this, about why I do so many uh, paintings of sleeping and, and, and resting uh, individuals, uh, I think what it is that I paint the sea a lot and I love the denizens of the sea, which are sailors, uh, sail, uh, fishermen, mermaids, and those are the those, those attract me because it's it's like you know you think of uh, uh, the sea has always been a place of mystery. You have Pablo Neruda who talks about the long voyage, which is more a psychological trip than an actual vacation. Then you have like Dylan Thomas talks about Captain uh, Cat and his associates. So all of that dreaminess and all that folklore that surrounds the sea attracts me. And perhaps uh, because of that, I use uh, the sleeping and or the uh, resting figures that uh, a part of the ocean, a part of the folklore and the mystery of the ocean. In this case, uh, by the way, uh, it's, uh, I, I should point out the color scheme, kind of interesting because we talked earlier, uh, Karen talked earlier, talked earlier about my upbringing in Scotland. And I found that I love the, the color scheme of green, gray, white, and black. And I think that's, because when I go up in Scotland, I would see those white houses with the sheep, well, the black and white, fa the black face, white sheep, and the gray days, and the black, white, gray, and black uh, became a combination of colors that sank into my psyche. And I find myself bringing it out quite often in my paintings. I think we're all affected by 
our childhood. And things happen that you're not aware of that keeps kind of, um, that stays in your mind. And I think that's one of the things. But anyhow, that's only the color scheme. Uh, do you have any questions? Well, I, first of all, I have to say that my favorite part of this painting is the skeletons of the fish. I, I, I love those bones. But, but, it, but, but the reason, one of the reasons I do is because when you look at this mermaid, she is not a particularly beautiful, alluring mermaid. She's- Well, she's, I'm glad of that. I, I know, <laughs> well, I, exactly. So I, I was going- She's not at, ugly either, actually. No, but. <laughs> no, but she's not, um, she, she, you know, she's not, she's not a movie star mermaid. So why, why, why does she look a little bit off? Well, you know, you, well, I don't. I'm not quite sure how to answer that actually. But she has, she has. For me, she feels like she's come out of the ocean because it was a, it's a turbulent ocean. She's come out mm. to rest. That's her rock. That's why the skeletons are there. That's where she eats. That's where she rests. That's where she sleeps. And she has turned her back from off, mm. from the sea and turned her back from the uh, mm. from the motion of the sea. Mm. So. Uh, so she's resting, and that's uh, that's basically uh, as far as her her expression to me is just right. I'm not quite sure uh, mm. why, but it, it fits it fits the painting for me. Mm. For me too. Okay. Uh, speaking of turbulent seas, oh, yeah. this this one is called "Fishing Off Tinkers." It's. Um, I, I hope that some of you will be able to see this one because the texture of it is so, it's so thickly painted. Uh, it's really, the, the texture is really, has to be, you have to see it, has to be experienced. But anyway, I, I had a, a, my question for Bill is when you paint something like this, we'll come to much more calm seas at, at well, like this, this first one, the sailor. But this is such a turbulent sea. When you paint that with such a heavy paint, thick, thickly painted, is your mood different? Is your mood more turbulent? Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you. Asked, I don't know you. I know because it's quite. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, in this particular painting. Uh, that Tinker, this is an island I, just off the coast here. I paint all the time Tinkers. Sometimes it's small like this, and sometimes it just becomes a line when I'm doing a more abstracted painting. But So it's just a kind of um, uh, a focus for me, Tinker's Island. Uh, this is fishing off Tinker's Island. It is very heavily painted. Now, the, the reason why it is, having done the, the Sleeping Sailor and so on, I felt a need to uh, be more physical in the painting. I feel, felt a need to throw the paint around a bit, you know, where I could throw my arm around and make gestures with the paint. Uh, and in this particular one, I wanted I, I wanted to do a rough sea, and I wanted to get the pull and push of the waves. Uh, and give the feeling of the turbulence that sometimes uh, often occurs outside my window here. And I've seen fishing boats working in the rough seas. And so all of this came together and I found that the scriptic here worked very well with the, the waves. Uh, and we're, you, know, you get more of a feeling of the movement of the, lip of the waves when it's painted in this way. The paint is thick, but I often use, in my, with my paint, I often use wax. I mix the paint with the wax, and it gives a certain a certain texture or iridescence to it, which I like. You won't be able to see it too much the way it is there, but in fact, that's what I do. And in this case, I used a palette knife a lot, and I but most of it was uh, sweeping arm gestures to get the get the turbulence of the sea. Next one is one of my favorites, and. A lot of people have really loved this one. The name of this one is Dora Dreaming. And I'm not quite sure whether Dora is dreaming the horse or the horse is dreaming Dora, but I, so many people have, have said they really like this one. What is there about this that you think draws people to it? It's good painting. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Bill. It's one of my favorites too. 
<laughs> but you know, you 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 laugh when you say that. But what do you mean by that? Well, I can only tell you how it came about. Actually, well, you know, uh, I love painting lines of trees, when, uh, and and I wanted to paint a line of trees, and I wanted to paint uh, when I, this was done. After one of after the sailor painting, and I just wanted to do a landscape, and I love trees, and I love the uh, I love that feeling of moonlight, where the uh, clouds flow by and the, the the moon peeks out from time to time, and the shadows move on the land and that kind of thing, and I I, I wanted to paint that sort of mysterious, strange landscape, and I found that the figure I needed a figure, and the figure I decided was Dora Maar. Dora Maar was Picasso's uh, girlfriend and also a surrealist photographer. Uh, so in a landscape that was so real, I wanted that, and that's why I call it Dora Dreaming. It's her, it's her dream, her landscape. Now, the reason why the white horse is there, you know, I, I've painted lots of white horses in my past. Uh, and, I, and in this particular case, the white horse is there because although the landscape and the movement of the clouds and, and shadows is, can be disturbing, the white horse is there to stabilize that and make it less mm. so. She, the horse is feeding quietly on the grass and it gives it a more calm sensation. Mm. Mm. So that's how it, those things are not developed intellectually. Those things are discovered on the canvas. I, I find them, I don't invent them ahead of time. Mm. Uh, and when it's right, it's right. And I find this painting sort of clicks and the mood and the feeling is right. So that's it. I explain it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter. I just like it the way it is. Yeah, me too. Before you uh, find Bill too, the, the colors in this painting, I think that's what grabs you right away. It just draws well, it right in, especially the yellow and the green. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, it's true. Well, I wanted the light, I wanted the, I needed the yellow to be brought down to the ground and the, uh, and I wanted her dress to reflect the moon and, and her face also reflects, mm. reflects the moon. It's more of a mask than a mm. human face. It's the mask, uh, mm. rather, yeah, and, and so it, it all, and the white, the arrangement, when one paints you have to, make sure that the arrangement of colors and shapes within the composition work together. And in this case, I feel we do. Um, the next ones we're going to look at are all sea paintings. And uh, I'll just ask Bill to say whatever he would like about each individual one. This one is called the Yellow Boat. Is that, you want me to, yeah. Well, this is interesting actually. Okay, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a rough sea and the yellow boat is sliding down, uh, down the waves. I wonder, sometimes after I paint something, I wonder why I've done it, you know, and, 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 I, and I, you know, so the yellow boat in this case, I should say that when I mentioned before uh, about the, the, the white sheep and the black faces when I was a child and how those things uh, kind of permeate your psyche and how they remain there. Well, I was thinking, one of the things I've noticed about my paintings, and I'm sure other people do too, that often there are areas of bright color within a rather a, 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 a more monotone uh, surface. There are pinpricks of color, and in this case, the yellow board and the two figures. And I, and I do that, much of my, many of my paintings are painted that way. Uh, the figurative paintings are painted that way. There are points of color. And I, and I thought about that, why do I do that? And, uh, and I thought that possibly, when I lived uh, in, in Scotland, I went to the Glasgow School of Art. I went to, I, I lived in Glasgow for a while. And in Glasgow, it was gray and overcast most of the time, foggy. But there were yellow trams that would rush down the streets, the trams being those streetcars. There were yellow streetcars uh, that would go down through the, through the, the dull landscape. And uh, people would get off in bright clothes. And I, it, it occurred to me that color is really something that people, uh, people have more than, 
more than nature in, in many ways. Wherever you find people, you find bright colors. You can go up the course here and you see that paper, uh, people who paint their houses, yellows and, and pinks and things like that. Color to me uh, is what people do to, to affirm their existence in this world. And so I often find that I do this when in my paintings. I, the color is concentrated uh, with pe to, to, to people and what's associated with them. Uh, it's also pictorially, it's a good thing uh, mm. uh, for me because it gives you a focus, a, a focal point in, in, in the picture, uh, uh, which works. And uh, I guess that's why I, you will find that many of my paintings, there's a concentration of color as it is in this, this painting. Want to go to the next one and see yeah. what that's like? All right. But they, the, the, so the color in this one <clears throat> is the is the uh, sailors in their coats. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Same reason. Same reason. Same reason. Actually, um, I should mention here. Well, there, there is no. This is my. This is another sceptic, but it's. Not, but I haven't moved the horizon because there is no mm -hmm. horizon. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a painting that. Where that that wanted to, where the horizon was gone, and the uh, and there's more of a depth behind behind the uh, the boat. Uh, the, the the painting. Uh, one thing I could point out here, uh, which uh, uh, which is involved in now, yeah. I'll, well, uh, seagulls uh, frequently pop into my paintings. Uh, well, it's not. Uh, 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 difficult to not know that because whenever I've lived on the coast of Scotland, the coast of Maine, seagulls are very much in, in view and it's they're part of my psyche again. As sleeping sailors, I have seagulls flying around my head most of the time. <laughs> so, but I want to mention that the reason, the great thing about seagulls is that not only are they uh, they have uh, a feeling to them, uh, the flight, the freedom, but also compositionally, they're a great way to correct and to balance compositions. And in this case here, you will see that the two seagulls, one below the other, um, line up with the line of the mast. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'll notice that the other, the one to the side, to, uh, to the one in the middle, gives lines up with the, with the line of the boat, uh, the, the hull of the boat, so that you have a structure which is tight. Uh, so you have moving ways and you have a tight structure. And I think I like that two things because movement that is wild and uncontrolled is not uh, to me acceptable. I think what I like is to have movement contained and the structure of the painting contains the uh, the contains the the movement and the mode, and seagulls help to do that. Do this you have one, a question? This, uh, <laughs> um, actually, no. This one is called "Under the Cloud," and I I I I especially like this one. I think because of the the way the colors and the, 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 the blocks of color play off against one another. Well, yes, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, clouds have always fascinated me. Uh, uh, they're, they're always there, they're out of the window and I look at them. And those ones were, are monumental clouds. They are the clouds that uh, stand up like blocks of stone, they're, they're monumental. And that sometimes happens and I love them. And so this is a painting of monumental clouds, and uh, and and it's under under the shadow of the cloud. I think is the title of the painting, uh, which and there's not much more to say about it actually. But uh, it's just monumental clouds on a calm day. The sea is calm. The clouds are towering above the boat, and uh, I wanted that. I wanted that feeling. And this one is called, this one is called Hauling the Traps. Hauling the Traps, yes. Do you have a question about that? <laughs> no, no, I, I just, um, because we see this so often, it has all the feeling to me that you get when you look out 
and you see the gulls crowding around the lobster boats because as they throw away the the crabs and the bait that's unused and, and the lobsters that are too small, the gulls are always there in a line or a cloud around the boat. And I just thought that that, that had the feeling so well of, I don't know, I just, I love this one. Yeah, well, that's true. As you thought we said, basically, is what it is. It's a chatter of cl of gulls. Is that right? Is that a, a chatter? I, I like that. A chatter that's of gulls. <laughs> if there is such it should a thing. be. Yeah, and uh, and of course, uh, the lobsterman uh, is un is is not paying any attention to the excitement of the gulls. He's concentrated on pulling his traps. Busy. But uh, you know, the thing I liked about this actually was the. Uh, the motion of the waves, uh, the motion of the sea there, because uh, you got the feeling of the swell and yeah. drop and that kind right. of thing. Uh, I've been out frequently on lobster boats and you've always got that feeling of the lift and the drop. Uh, and uh, I wanted to try and convey that in some way. I, I, I'm getting tired of saying, I really love this one, but okay. Well, I haven't yet found one that I don't. So oh, oh, here we you go. Better not. Uh, no. <laughs> the next one is, oh, uh, um, you've done a few of these. Well, th this one actually uh, goes back to the sleeping sailor. Right. You know, instead of the sleeping sailor, I have three fishermen who are resting in the midday sun. Now, you know, this, uh, I remember, I used to go down to Storrington, where I live, and uh, I used to sketch down there on, on the docks, and uh, there was a, 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 fisher, a fisherman's hut like that. Storrington has changed a lot, it's become much more gentrified, but in those days, it was very much a, 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 a lobster place. Uh, and uh, I used to go there a lot, and that, the feel of the place uh, was wonderful. And I did see some resting fishermen way back, and it's always stuck in my mind, three men, three men resting. Uh, there is a painting by Miles and Hartley of uh, fishermen on the dock. Uh, they're not sleeping, and I wanted to do one that was, was resting. So I put all those guys together. They're obviously very friendly with one another. <laughs> So anyhow, that's, I just wanted to get the mood of, of uh, as, as, I, as the other um, sleeping people, a sense of, uh, of dreaminess, a sense of otherworldliness. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, we have in the foreground there all of the paraphernalia of, of, of a working, working man's boat, you know, the traps and so on and so on. And in the background, we have not, uh, not, lobster bots, but sail bots, leisurely, the people who spend their time enjoying the sea, not the people who spend their days working on the sea. So once again, I like to have that dichotomy of the, of, of the two things. And I think that adds to the power of the painting. Well, I also like that in, in, in so many of these, there are as you say, there are two lives going on, and each one is unaware of the other. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the sailors can't even see these fishermen because they're, mm -hmm. they're hidden mm -hmm. by the hut, and, this, and the fishermen could care less about the sailboats. So I, I just really like that. Kind well, of that, yeah. well, that's basically the feeling I was trying to, well, the feeling that comes out, and when I say the feeling I was trying to get, I don't work towards something, I work to discover something, and I just, uh, and that's how it comes out, and you're right. Uh, no, I just want to add, too, it's really interesting, too, is the, sh the shadow that's cast on the right-hand side of the shed must be coming from a building that's out of the viewer's plane. Mm -hmm. Well, the shadow cast on here. Yes. On the right hand side must be right hand side must be from another building somewhere. Kind of interesting. Well, is it? See, see that that line. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, as I said at the beginning, logic is not my <laughs> strong part. No, but it makes you feel like you can that there is a presence in front of you know there's structures in front of the fishermen that are 
just subjectively there from the shadow. Yes. Know, which makes it really beautiful and it's an interesting compositional element. Yeah. yeah. But it yeah. has to be a building that's out of view plane. Yeah, I don't pay much attention to where the sun is. <laughs> well, we have one more of these split, split ticks, whatever, what, split now ticks. The split ticks. Um, this one is called Scudic Surf. And uh, this, to me, this, uh, this painting just, just really has it all. But one of the things that I, I love about it is that it appeals to many more senses than just sight. Um, when I look at this, I can hear booming surf. I can smell salt air. I can feel if you're if you know scudic, when you stand too close to those waves, you feel them on you. And um, it's just to me such a powerful painting, and and juxtaposed against this very gentle pink background in, in places. Anyway, I, I but what would you like to say about this one? Well, not, not, not a great deal. You know, uh, two of my favorite painters have painted surf that have always appealed to me. One, of course, is Martin Hartley, who painted a marvelous painting, I think it was called the North Sea or something like that, of surf breaking on the shore. Um, and the other painter which, uh, who painted surf that appealed to me greatly was Milton Avery. And Milton Avery had this marvelous, uh, uh, almost a square block of surf uh, breaking on the shore. So uh, I wanted to paint, I've always, I, I like painting surf. And those two painters and their paintings have stuck in my mind a long time. Then when I'm doing my split take, I decided I wanted to do a surf painting that was my own and my own invention uh, and, and in a sense challenged Milton Avery's surf. <laughs> so anyway, this is the reason, not the reason, but th that's why I painted the surf painting because I wanted to paint it and I knew that it was, a, it was an important subject for many painters who, who I admire. Uh, and, I, and, and once again, as I said uh, in several other of the paintings, the reason why the, the, the colors are muted and the, and, and the sky is a pale pink and, this, and the sea is calm, not, not turbulent, but yet you have these large uh, surf, uh, blocks of surf breaking, is because once again, the, the, the dichotomy of movement and vigor and, and action against quiet and, uh, and the placid sea, to me, enhances the, uh, the, uh, the feeling of, 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 of beauty. Uh, I think, was it, was it, um, was it um, Oscar Wilde who said at the heart of every beautiful flower there is an insect? Didn't he say that? I don't know. Well, anyhow, <laughs> I, I like the idea that beauty and, and calmness and, 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 and turbulence can go together and enhance one another. And that's uh, what I sometimes use in my paintings, but I use it by discovery, not by intent. Uh, that's actually the last of the split ticks. And, and we just have, there are two more images to look at. And these are images in which color plays a significant part. I'll, I'll show you this in, and then that one, um, Bill. What do you want to say about the use well, of there color? Well, there, there isn't much. There isn't much to say about well, the, this one. Was painted before, before I did the split ticks, uh, and and it was it's more um, more like the paintings I was doing at this time, and the green one is that follows it, actually, uh, both of them. But so the, they are much more abstracted. They yeah. are much more abstracted. Could, could I yeah. go back to that pink one? Uh, it's kind of, it's interesting that at that particular time that I painted this, uh, I bought at an auction a pink, <laughs> a, a painting by a, a well-known British painter, um, Bill, uh, uh, Bill, uh, well, anyhow, a wealthy <laughs> British painter, Turnbull, Bill Turnbull, actually, and 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 he did. Uh, I bought at the auction 
a painting called the pink, uh, it's called the pink or pink square. I think it's called pink square. Anyhow, it's just a, it's just a sheet of pink. There are no shapes, it's just a, a, a sheet that's pink. And I thought, I, I lived with it for a while and I thought, no, it doesn't work because <laughs> it does not include what I find very important, an illusion, uh, a, a reference to, to, to what is real. To, uh, that the abstract can only work to me if it's part of the landscape where you can maneuver your, uh, your, your abstract shapes, but not lose the sense of reality, the sense of a place. And that's why I decided to do my own pink square. And uh, I, did, I did this one, and I think, uh, it, for me, it works. For me, it works. I think the structure is strong, the movement is, is right. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a better painting than Bill Turnbull's. Yeah, uh, <laughs> by, by a lot, by a lot. Well, yeah. And this one here, this one here, much the same thing. It's the abstraction without losing a feeling that is natural. Uh, many painters have painted the square. The square is a beautiful structure. It's strong, it's stable, and, uh, and the square is something, as I say, that uh, is very appealing for its for its uh, for its stability and its expression, and, and this happens to be the, a green cloud reflecting on the, on the ocean, uh, and I, I I like it because it's uh, it's strong without uh, an abstract without losing that sense of a place. I think that's the end of it. Yeah, I I think so too. Um, Karen, I um I know you wanted to leave some time for questions. So if you want to uh, hit the stop share, we can go back to, there, there we are. There you are. And, uh, yeah. So I'll let you figure out how to do questions. If any. We'd, we'd like to open it up to questions. And what you need to do is raise your hand if you have your participants. I think you do that from, Somewhere on your participants, if you're familiar with it, go ahead and raise your hand and we will unmute you. I like that. <laughs> Tried to unmute my watch and it's not working. Um, I think you can unmute yourself if you're not familiar with how to raise your hand. So if there is somebody that has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, if you want me to unmute you, you have to raise your hand. Sarah, are you on there? Oh, here we have a question from Francois. Um. Hi. Uh, nice, nice to see you. I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. I love seeing things. So I wasn't very familiar with them, and now used to be familiar with them, so thank you. Um, I, um, I noticed the Burmese painting had seemed to have additional splits, not just beyond the trip, up to four or something. And so I like the fact that the logic didn't say, well, I have to have three, only three. <laughs> so, but I did want to ask, coming from Scotland, and the Burmese picture made me think about David Thompson's People of the Sea and Selkies. And I wondered if that, had it ever entered your consciousness? The 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 Selkies. Um, you, you remember we talked about Selkies a little while ago, yeah. but you never really did anything with them. There, Francois, remind remind people what Selkies are. Yeah, I remember. I remember them. But I believe they're the they're the the gray seals that are that are also shape changers, and they're enter into many legends about. Love affairs between people yeah. and seals and people being the part, the part taken of, away, or yeah, yeah, the, the part yeah. of the mythology of yeah. the ocean and the, like like sirens, yeah, in, yeah. in Greek mythology. Uh, but all of that, all of that gives me uh, a, a reason and authority to to paint whatever I want because uh, <laughs> you know we are as artists. We are imaginative, and imagination is what drives us. 
and uh, the, whether that has not purposely entered me, but I accept them with open arms because it, <laughs> it helps it helps greatly in the, uh, to imagine in your imagination. I think. Thank and, you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> So you just need to unmute yourself. If anybody else has a question, um, just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, I, I've unmuted muted myself, but I don't know how to raise my hand. Well, it looks like you did. Are you, who are you? I'm Chris Johnson. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Marge. Hi, Bill. Nice to hear from you. Hey. Aren't are we all aging gracefully? <laughs> okay. I, my question, Bill, is your hall. Can you hear me okay? I can yes. hear you, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I've read all your books. I've actually read them, not just looked at them. And, and so I hope these new ones become a book. Um, I am really struck by the power of these new ones. I, I don't. I'm not saying your older ones were static, but these are so, to me, more emotional and physically moving. I was really kind of seasick with your hauling the traps. That one is really, and I don't get seasick, but I just, I wondered, I just um, totally changed how I paint and you have to a certain degree. What do you like better? Do you like the new style better? The new ideas better? Or would you go back to your old way? New ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, Chris. I, I, one, I'm not excluding other paintings. No. Uh, I will no, go. No. I will go back, and when it's necessary to split the canvas, I will. But it's not. It's not uh, like I put everything else behind me. That's not true, actually. No. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I'm finding that uh, as you work, as you know, because you are an artist too, as you work, you are discovering things. You are opening doors which lead, lead to other doors. And mm -hmm. I don't know, and I have no idea where I, at the moment, whether this is the end. I hope not. I hope <laughs> this is only the beginning, the beginning of something else. You know, it, it, Art is a creative process, and uh, we'll see where it leads. Did you feel that this really, um, did it kind of overwhelm you with new ideas and, and the triptych and this, and this yes. the slip trick? Well, you know, it's interesting that, now I should, part, I, I should mention you know, that when I did this, I was amazed to find that no one ever, no one, and I know, I know of, had ever used this method. I find that I discovered this whole thing all by myself. Um, so, you know, uh, that gave me a thrill to discover something, but that's part of the process. And I'm hoping to go on from this and find other things that improve the punch, the mood the, 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 uh, of a painting. You know, yeah. I mean, painting should hit you and sink deep inside you and your psyche. And I'm looking for better ways to do that. And, and I, I think they're wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thanks, yeah, Marge. Thank you, Chris. I, and and I, would, I would just add that all of these paintings and they're, they're big, uh, mm -hmm. were done in a relatively short period of time. Bill was working every day, all day. Uh, mm -hmm. Just he was out in the studio every single day, working, sketching, going out there to work. So it was a it was a hugely creative, productive time for him. And maybe that had something to do with the fact that there was nothing else to do. We we couldn't <laughs> go anywhere. We, oh, yeah. we would nobody. We weren't traveling. Um, and we were just, it, it was a very productive time. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for it. Yeah, me too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we had another question here from MP Donahue. Um, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, uh, 
Bill, this is Patricia Donahue over in Deer Isle. I have one of your little houses. I have a couple of your paintings. Um, okay. I'm very excited about your new work. And, right. and your wife, Marjorie, just answered part of my question, but I'm curious as you go along decade after decade, are you painting as much or are you painting more? And how does it feel to be doing that? Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. I'm painting more than ever. I, I, I've always painted, yeah, I've been painting since I, I think it was something like 10 years old. I actually have a painting hanging up in my house here. I did when I was 14. Uh, one and a half. Yeah. I, since I was 14 and, uh, and, and I quite like it actually, but I've been painting ever since. And uh, I really, your know, painting is an obsession. For me, it's an obsession. I don't stop. I've never stopped. And uh, I think I am painting more than ever now. I realize that time is short and I've got to, if I'm going to express, I'm trying to reach something that's still out of reach. And as I know the time is short, I am painting more and faster. And uh, I will see where it leads, but I, I haven't done the perfect painting yet. And I'm <laughs> trying to do that. And, I, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe one day, or maybe not at all, I will achieve that. So I'm working very hard at the moment. Uh, we have another question here from Mary White. <laughs> What's she doing here? <laughs> What's she doing here? <laughs> um, Bill, I think they're wonderful. And um, I got to see them a couple of months ago. But I think that I've never seen you do work that is so harmonious. Um, the narrative, your composition, and the color. The narrative is so, and the object is so important in these paintings. And they feel sort of more fun and bringing everything together. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Meg. Thank you. Good of you to come. Did I, we, should we tell people that this is my daughter, Meg White? Who has a gallery in Boston? Yes. Yeah. And have excellent taste. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. Josie hey. wants to say hello and she loves them. Oh, thanks, Josie. That was Josie. Oh, thank yeah. you, Josie. Thank you, Josie. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, we have a question from Jill. Hi, Margin and Bill. Hi, Jill. Hi, Jill. Hi, Jill. I love how you opened um, your dialogue about the paintings, Bill, saying that you didn't think that logic belonged in a painting. And um, as you know, can you hear me? Yes, I can now, yes. Great, okay. And, and as you know, we have, um, you know, both uh, Marston Hartley and Milton Avery are, are some of my heroes as well. What I wanted um, to ask you is, do you get surprised by what happens in your paintings? Maybe not when you're doing them, but take stepping back. And I know that you're working quickly. When you step back a day or two later, it's kind of like, oh, it, it, that's there. I mean, do, do you surprise yourself? Do I surprise myself? Yeah. Well, Jill, thank you for thank you for coming. By the way, Jill, uh, if a painting is good at all, it surprises you. That's the whole point of painting, really. You've got to be surprised. If you're not surprised, no one's going to be surprised. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I think that, uh, and, I, and I often, the, when I paint, the reason I stop painting a painting is when it surprises me. Uh, uh, if it doesn't surprise me, I have to go on work, working until it does. Uh, and especially, uh, I frequently, actually, I've, I see paintings of mine that I haven't seen in years. And, they, and that's when they do surprise me more than ever, because I have forgotten about them and suddenly I see them. And I think, oh, who painted that? <laughs> you know, so, yes, <laughs> I'm surprised. I think it's, a good painting should always surprise you. Well, that's I, want great. To, I, I think that's, it's, that's not only true of painting, actually. Um, Robert Frost said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And I, I think that anybody who's creative at some point looks at something and says, where did that come from? Because logic and planning had nothing to do with it. 
That's great to hear. And I would like to go back and amend my thesis for those of people who are looking who um, at, at the Zoom, uh, I interviewed Bill for my, uh, my MFA thesis recently. So I'd like to amend this um, with some of the remarks you made tonight. So thanks a lot. And thanks for the gorgeous uh, thank work. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you, Jill. Are there any more questions from anybody? You can either raise your hand. If you don't know how to do that, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, yeah, we have one from Alice Rector. Alice Rector, she's an artist at the gallery. There, am I unmuted now? I am. Yeah. Hi, Bill, thank you for your beautiful work. And it just, it's delightful and it, it has humor and joy and also darkness in a way that I think is just wonderful. Will you talk about memory and how you use memory and maybe how your use of memory has changed from the time you were a young man until now? Well, I don't think, I, I don't really think memory does change. I think memory is always, it, 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 the strongest memories are always the strongest memories. You know, uh, things come to mind when I see, see a color, or I smell a smell, or I remember a place, you know, uh, that those, those are the triggers that trigger memory. And I can't say they have changed much. Maybe, perhaps, if I understand what you're saying, perhaps as I get older, uh, memories play a, a more important part in my life, uh, but not so much in my painting, you know, in my everyday life perhaps, but not in my painting. Uh, there are, uh, memories come up in my paintings, but they come up naturally. They do not, uh, they come up without me understanding why they're there. They just come to the surface and impose themselves on my paintings. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's... That does. Thank you. And I, 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 you're using memory as a tool, and uh, that's wonderful. Well, yeah, I use it as a tool, but this is not something I bring to the surface in order to paint. It's something that comes by itself into my work. Such as, such as the, uh, the mermaid one with the color scheme. I had no idea that I was using that color scheme until I had used it. Then I realized, wow, I have used that color scheme in several other paintings and why? And I think, oh, that must be from my childhood, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, that was a great question. We have another question here from Elise. Just take a minute to have her unmute. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Oh, no, oh my goodness. Uh, Felice, you, you look quite, you sound, you don't sound like Felice, Rick. Good afternoon. <laughs> Phil, it's a great show. I love your new work, by the way. I, I wanted to ask you a question. Do you ever get to the point when you're painting something where you're kind of in the middle of the uh, process and you abandon the painting because it's just not going where you want it to go, or you can't see the end of it. How, how does that work? Or do you go back to it at that point yeah. and some epiphany hits you and you say, well, now I can really see where I want it to go. Or do you sometimes just have to walk away? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, it's quite true. Sometimes when you're working and the painting's not going anywhere and you're messing it up and you're trying to get it to go right and it doesn't work, uh, at that point, you're better to leave it and start another painting. And maybe later, you go back, you look at it, you say, there was something there, but I didn't get it right. What is it I didn't get right? And you begin to see things a little bit more clearly. At that point, what you do is you take a big brush and a lot of paint, <laughs> and you attack it. You know there's, there's you know there's no cost to you because you're not ruining a good painting. The le the most uh, that can happen is that you're creating a good painting. The least that can happen is you're ruining a bad painting. So it doesn't <laughs> matter. So it gives you the freedom to attack a painting and put put your uh, put everything into it and. Pop the air, and, and quite often it works out that a bad painting becomes a good painting once you no longer feel 
you, you've no longer held back because you want to, you're afraid of ruining it. Uh, you've already ruined it, so now <laughs> you get a chance to to bring it to life again. And I often like doing that. I often look at a painting that has a little bit of goodness to it, and I think to myself, hey, there's something there I don't want to lose, but it's no good the way it is. So, as I say, pick up the biggest brush I have, the palette knife, and I go, go for it. 